Hey everyone, back again. Today I want to take the opportunity to recount Heidegger's criticisms of Immanuel Kant and being in time. So here I'm not going to be looking at all of his lectures on the metaphysics and like his critiques of Kant and the, that whole thing. Just in being and time, because it's important if you want to get into this text to understand Kant and the way that Heidegger distances himself from Kant and views it some of Kant's ideas. So before jumping into that, hi, I'm David. I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, like, share, subscribe, you'll see videos at least every week, sometimes twice a week. Isn't that fun? If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it just as a podcast on pretty much any podcast platform. If you found this as a podcast, you'll be able to find the video on YouTube, which is fun. And yeah, if you want to follow me anywhere that in here, you can find all links for such things in the description. You can also help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal no pressure to do that. Just tell your friends. I mean, that's a great way to help. Maybe they love this stuff and there's a lot to glean from it. Don't forget to tell me what you think. Like leave comments. I love reading what you all have to say. You all offer really insightful stuff. Even when you're criticizing me, I love it. Leave a comment. If it's good, if it's funny. I'll pin it. Everyone can see it and they can laugh at me. Isn't that great? That'll be awesome. So yeah, let's get into Heidegger's critique of Kant in being and time. Before talking about Heidegger though, let's talk about Kant. So in the Critique of Pure Reason, which is Heidegger's focus in being and time, Kant suggests that in order for us to have experience in the world, humans have an innate ability to grasp space and time. Now I'm being super reductive here. If you want more on this, I've done episodes just on the Critique of Pure Reason, and his other critiques. I've done episodes on just the transcendental aesthetic in which he talks about the possibilities for experience, that is, experience having to exist in space and time. So I'm being super reductive. Go check out those if you want, if you want more. But just here, it's important to understand that Kant suggests that space and time are necessary for us to have experience. That is, we have to exist in space and time. We cannot imagine otherwise. You cannot imagine yourself outside of space, and you cannot imagine yourself outside of time. They are necessary for us to grasp things in experience out there in the world that we could then take in, that we can then touch and perceive, that our minds will then, our brains will then generate an image of. However, he is clear that space and time, despite the way that I'm framing it, don't just exist out there that we are born into the world and then we learn about space and time. That's not true. For Kant, rather, we have an innate capacity to grasp space and time. That is, they already exist up here. You are born already knowing about space and time. It's like within us. So that encourages us to ask, okay, well, is space and time real? Are they real? Do, do, does it exist out there or is it just in here? I mean, it's a, it's a hard thing to answer. Who really knows? But in any case, he offers us this idea as a condition to understand how experience itself is possible. And he uses this as a way to understand kind of the human experience in the world. What is universal in the human experience? It is to experience space and time. Now the actual nitty gritty of it, like there's a lot more to it than that. But that's kind of the core of what it means to be in the world as a human, as a being, to experience the world, to be a part of the world. Now flash forward to Martin Heidegger's Being in Time, in which he seeks to unravel or to problematize the history of philosophy's approach to the question of being. What does it mean to exist in the world? What is the impetus behind being? Where does it come from? What does it mean to be? And so in order to do this, he has to look at the entire history of philosophy, which he kind of does, and criticize as many thinkers, which he does, like Aristotle and Kant, also Descartes, he criticizes for a very similar reason to Kant with some minor differences. But he takes aim at Kant because he, I think that he sees a lot of value in what Kant is going to does, what Kant says. However, he thinks that Kant completely ignores what makes us human. And that's not just because we experience things in the world. It is that we exist in the world. 
that we form communities in the world, that we exist with others in the world, that we are able to shape that world. So he thinks that Kant, and he mounts very similar critique against Descartes, Descartes against Descartes, to say that, hey, this is all well and good. Maybe this is a good starting point to understanding what actually makes us tick. But this is only going to remain at a kind of mechanical and abstract level. That is, it reduces humans to just their ability to experience the world. And it treats things in the world like just these objects we encounter without any other significant meaning attached to it. So his issue is to say that in existing in the world, in being, we are not just existing in space, as Kant says. You don't encounter things in space. Instead, you encounter things in a world. And in a world, and for a world to be created, means that you actually de-distance, you bring things together in space, and also more like abstractly, you, bring, you hold things close to you, your emotions, like your friends, the people you care for, the things, the places that you most frequently go to, you hold them close to you. You don't just treat them as all being like universally a part of space. No one does that. I mean, that's not actually part of existing in the world. We have a much more intricate relationship with the world, with people and with things than Kant says. So in being what Heidegger calls Dasein, which translates to the being there, he's referring to those things, those beings, those creatures that exist in worlds, which we all do. We all belong to a world. So the very essence of our being is not bound up with just being part of space or within space, but with being inside of these worlds. That our Dasein or that Dasein is born into and adopts and can therefore then shape that world in a kind of phenomenological way, kind of giving and taking. We shape the world, the world shapes us. Where does that leave time though? Because with Kant, we exist in both space and time. Well, it seems like Heidegger is kind of on the same wavelength here. Heidegger thinks time is totally necessary, and that is because for Dasein even to exist, for it to have come into existence from non-existence, or from non-space, if we can say that, it must have come along as a function of time. Time must always be there in order to push it into being in the world. And when it is finally in that world, it exists along the function of time, along the horizon of time. It moves with time in that world. And when it exists in that world, it is guided by action. It moves. It flows, it adapts to the world, it contributes to the world. It is therefore, for Heidegger, guided by care. Care is intimately bound up with our sense of being. Again, like we aren't just talking about kind of a, an abstract connection to space and time just universally existing like as part of the human experience. It is much more intricate than that. And what is necessary in terms of time that Heidegger holds on to is that it points us to our eventual end in the form of our death. And this is what permits Dasein, even as it exists in a world that shapes it, it permits Dasein to be like, my time is not forever, so I better exist as best as I can at every, every given moment to embrace my own potentiality of being. So yeah, I hope that that clarified the distinction between Kant and Heidegger, at least Heidegger's issue with Kant, what he borrows from Kant, what the issues that he has with it in being in time, in case you plan on reading it. Just, you know, check out all the episodes I'm doing on Being in Time right now, or if this is years in the future, check out all the ones that I have done all on Being in Time if you want a lot more into this. But yeah, tell me what you think. Like, is Heidegger on point in criticizing Kant this way? Is he totally off base with this de-distancing thing? Like, we still have to exist in space. Like, does he overplay his downplaying of spatiality of space in favor of temporality? Let me know what you think. I'd really love to hear about it. Yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, and on that note, take care.